shapeshifters hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. This is your host Christopher, and I'm here with my good friend and host Tom. Howdy! What's going on? How have you been, Tom? What have you been up to? Oh, uh, lots and lots of uh, uh, work and renovation. The house continues to be in a state of defunct. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, but hey, I got my living room back, so I'm super excited about that. Yeah, I was gonna say you you see the light at the end of the tunnel of your renovations, don't aren't you? I do. Yes, uh, like uh, second floor has floors. Um, bathroom is underway. Can move my son's stuff back up into his room, hopefully by the weekend. So yeah. We're coming in for a landing. Was hoping to be done by Halloween, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, well, hopefully the the, the last couple of weeks of, or whatever will go as uh, smoothly as it can be. That would be the plan, yes. Have you been able to watch anything in your... Uh, for the most part, uh, not... I haven't dipped into too much i've been keeping up with the new season of loki which is the only thing that marvel has left to uh string its hopes and dreams on because <laughs> loki is actually a solid series it's uh it's fun and at the moment it is the source of the backbone material that is to drive the current phase of marvel so this since kang the conqueror is the uh the baddie of this particular phase, they are building his uh, his uh, character. Um, he's been introduced in a couple of other things. He was part of the first season of Loki. Um, he was featured prominently in the last Ant-Man movie. Uh, but the, the circumstances of that last season and the, the movie all end with that particular version of Kang essentially meeting his end. Um, but that's the beauty of their multiverse setup is because they've done all that they ha have, well, now Kang is free to be multiple versions of himself all over the multiverse. Um, and this is where we're starting to dip into, uh, and it's perfect for time shifters, it's this notion of chicken and the egg kind of thing. We have a character that centers around time and how time works and flows and has learned a little bit and has already established a plan to make variants of himself smarter, faster, because he can provide them with additional information. So oh, it's actually, okay. a, it, it, it's a very complicated and well done series it's just that's all that there is for marvel these days <laughs> gotcha well at least i know where to go uh when i watch the next marvel movie and, and and realize i have no idea what people are talking about i know where to go to <laughs> catch up yeah yeah not to mention tom tom hiddleston is just amazing as loki and having him sit on this weird quasi is he villain? Is he hero? Kind of thing is giving him lots of leeway to have some fun. So excellent, cool. Yep, I watched a couple things in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, one of which was kind of filling in a, a, a gap of I kind of feel ashamed I have not watched this until now. Yeah. I finally watched Todd uh, Browning's 1932's Freaks. Okay. I've, I'd never watched it before. I don't know why I never got around to watch it. I just never watched it before. Finally dialed that thing up. Mm -hmm. That film's brilliant. Nice. <laughs> there, there's a reason that people are still talking about this movie, all the, you know, 90 some years later. I can't uh, say that I'm familiar with it. Oh, you've never seen it either. Okay. No. Well, you know, 1932, I didn't. Little, little out of your general wheelhouse, I guess. <laughs> 
Yeah, you you tend to dip way in the Wayback Machine more than I do. I definitely would recommend checking out. It is, it 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 is a masterclass in filmmaking and a really good. It's just, it's really good. Uh, I, I posted that I'd been watching it and uh, I was thinking this exact same thing. Friend Dave Minkus piped in. He commented that it's one of those items that he's waiting for like the Barnes and Nobles 50% off criterion sale. <laughs> there you go. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be looking at the same thing because <laughs> I really want to see a really nice clean remastered with lots of special features on this one. Cause yeah, I really dug it. What's interesting is, so I, I did, I just pulled this up um, on IMDB and sort of seeing the little clip that they're running. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is many of the characters that are that are appearing just in the little clip that I'm seeing were duplicated not that long ago in a in American Horror Story. Yes, yes, that's where they uh, got a lot of inspiration for that particular season. Yeah, I, it's funny how quickly I pick up on that, and I mean I've never seen Freaks. All I got to see is a quick 30 second clip and I'm like, I've seen this before, at least elements from it. Mm hmm. So that's crazy. Yeah, nah, it's definitely one I would recommend seeking out. I'll definitely have to check that one out. It's not as easy to find as I thought it was. I was under the impression this was public domain. I figured I'd find it all over YouTube and such. Yeah. I could not find it free Really? Oh, anywhere. I, I found some obscure app on the Roku. It was like Brandon's Basement or something like that. <laughs> and it, it had it streaming on there. So I like I, I installed the app long enough to watch freaks on the app. Interesting. <laughs> and, and it went okay. There was it, it I don't know if it just buffered or if it had spots that were supposed to be ad breaks that the ads never played or something. Huh. The screen would just kind of go black for a second. You'd see the little wheel spin, and then it would come back. Huh. But it didn't... I mean, it just kind of surprised you a little bit when it happened right in the middle of a scene or something like that. But it, So that's another reason where it's like, yeah, okay, I need to get this on, like, the Criterion and watch, like, a really good copy that isn't interrupted. <laughs> well, no, I, I could get that. But, yeah, no, you would think... I mean, the movie's almost 100 years old. <laughs> right, yeah, so... So maybe it is not public domain like I thought it was, or someone's done a lot of uh, working behind the scenes to pull the copyright back, you know, into play or something. Hmm. Not sure, but uh, yeah, if you can find it, uh, definitely think it's 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 worth a viewing. It's very short, it's like maybe an hour long. Yeah, no, I'm having it pulled up here. It's an hour and four minute runtime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's it's really good. Cool. I'll have to check that out. Uh, not at all related, and kind of almost on the opposite end of the spectrum. I finally watched 1980s Alligator. <laughs> <laughs> Still fitting it in with my kind of like a Jaws clone uh, that I've been watching here lately. Yeah. This one being an American version of a Jaws clone, and with an alligator instead of a shark. Uh, as far as the clones of that film go. This one was really fun. This really? was a good one, especially for a United States, a, a U.S. Uh, attempt. Mm-hmm. Really, really enjoyed it. And uh, the actor Robert Forster, who stars in it, I've seen him in a few things. I think he's like one of those little underrated actors. I think he's really good. I, he's kind of one of those actors where you might not know his name, but if you see him, you're like, oh, that guy. You know you've seen him in something. No, I, I, yeah, no, he's a character actor from, like, all over the place. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, this was this was a good film, and it was a little bit, bit just like Jaws. They apparently had a giant animatronic alligator that didn't always work. So they had to <laughs> kind of limit its time on screen, which really works, kind of benefits the film. And it also means that they have to, unfortunately, do some real alligator on, like, miniature set sort of thing to make it look like, well, semi-miniature set to make it look like a giant alligator. Yeah. And I'm not going to say it isn't noticeable. (laughs) It's not as egregious as I've seen some things. It's not like giant Gila monster noticeable, 
but it's noticeable. <laughs> That's too funny. But it actually, it makes it a little bit more fun, I think. Honestly, that's about all I've really been... There's been some other things that I've gotten up to that have just, uh... Well... I watched 1984's film She. Yeah. That is awful. <laughs> I'm trying to remember if I've ever seen She. I wouldn't be surprised if this came up in one of your kind of uh, weekly bad movie watches. <laughs> yeah. Because it's exactly the type of film that you guys would watch. <laughs> I, I love that we're getting uh, quite the uh, reputation now. <laughs> my my comment on this thing when I posted is like was that it's astonishing that there was any cocaine for the rest of the eighties after they made this film. <laughs> I thought I was kind of dialing up a little another sort of sword and sorcery sort of thing, but yeah. it's apparently a post-apocalypse where everyone decides to wear loincloths again. Uh, it's just, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. It sounds it. I'm trying to remember the one. Uh, I can't find it. There's like a, there's one that we watched uh, that sounds reminiscent. It was like called like America Three Thousand or something. Sure, yeah, it, it's in that vein. Yeah, I, I mean, I was looking for another like Ator or something like that or Red Sonia, and instead, yeah, I get you know Bronx Three Thousand or whatever it is, or <laughs> after the fall of whatever. Yeah, a little disappointing in that. It it's so bad. It's almost fun it, this would be a great one to sit around with friends have a beer or two and just have a blast with i guess i'm gonna have to add it to the list yeah. <laughs> if nothing else has got beautiful women and skins <laughs> well it's no uh, nude nuns with big guns but <laughs> <laughs> yes folks that's the title of a real movie <laughs> But yeah, that's all I've kind of been up to. I'm sure I've watched a couple other things, but they're not worth really talking about. So maybe we'll uh, we'll cut the start of the show a little short and go ahead and do a break, play a promo for another podcast. And then when we get back, we are going to look at 2015's Jupiter Ascending. Welcome to Film Gazers, a podcast focusing on the science fiction, horror, fantasy, trinity, and 20th century entertainment. I'm Steph. I'm Jess. We're cousins slash besties. Join us as we reminisce, discuss, and review films from our childhood. Follow on Instagram at Film Gazers and listen to the show wherever you like to get your podcasts. Later, taters! We've been taught that the birthplace of the human race is Earth, but it's not. Do you know what this will do to people when they find out the truth? I don't think that most people would want to know the truth. I do. Your planet was seeded by a brass axe industries roughly 100,000 years ago. It's one of the most powerful dynasties in the universe. There are three primary heirs. The oldest is Belem. He's the one that controls this planet and wants you dead. I am telling you, I am nobody. You are royalty. What about the girl? It's still alive. Bring her to me. exact same genes reappear in the exact same order. It is what you call reincarnation. Her Majesty's life is going to change if she wants it to. I'm still the same me. Right now, Balem owns the title to Earth. Once you claim it, the Earth will belong to you. I will harvest that planet tomorrow before I let her take it from me. 
Have you ever seen a harvest? Never. But I've heard they feel no pain. You should have told me the truth about why you wanted her. Your Majesty, I have more in common with a dog than I have with you. I love dogs. I've always loved dogs. Here we go. Jupiter Ascending was written and directed by the Wachowskis. It stars Mila Kunis, Channing Tatum, Sean Bean, and Eddie Redmayne. Jupiter Jones, a young cleaning woman, is mysteriously attacked by extraterrestrials. Kane Wise, a human-canine hybrid, rescues her and tells her that he has been assigned to find her and bring her to an audience with brother and sister Titus and Kalik Abraxas, two members of a space-faring ruling family. While protecting her from numerous attacks, it is discovered that she is actually royalty. Finally managing to escape Earth, she learns that she is the genetic reincarnation of the Queen Mother and that once she claims her title, she will be the owner of the entire Earth. Each sibling, as well as another brother, Balaam, have their own motivations to stop or kill Jupiter in order to claim Earth for themselves. Jupiter discovers the dark truth about the origins of life on this planet and countless others as she struggles to survive. Apparently, the Wachowskis were approached by Warner Brothers in 2009 and asked to create an original property for a potential franchise. And this story is something they came up with, was partially inspired by a favorite book of Lena Wachowski, The Odyssey. And she also brought in elements of The Wizard of Oz. Uh, One of the things that makes this film a little unique to a lot of others at the time is many of the stunts relied on practical effects and actual stunt work. Uh, For the sequence when Kane is rescuing Jupiter over the city of Chicago with his gravity boots, they devised a special rig of six cameras suspended from a helicopter in order to capture nearly 180 degrees. And they were then able to overlap the footage, creating creating the appearance of a camera that would swing around the action. And scenes with Kane skating with his boots closer to the ground were done with rollerblades and ramps that were then digitally removed. With a budget estimated between $175 and $200 million, it grossed just under $50 million in the U.S., but saw larger returns in foreign markets, getting a total of about $184 million worldwide. Now, in an interview with Happy, Sad, Confused podcast, as reported by Variety, Mila Kunis said she knew the film would be a flop, <laughs> and she knew before they even started filming. What, quote, when did we know the movie would flop? Before we started production, because our production got slashed in half. And so the original budget was twice as much, and you can do a lot more with a lot more money. And oftentimes those types of scripts have a very good storyline, but extraordinary other things. Right before pre-production, for a multitude of reasons with studios and other things, the budget got cut and the movie was different. Mm. I also read that Natalie Portman was originally uh, cast as Jupiter Jones, but she dropped out. And I'm wondering if that might have been at least partially a reason for the studio to slash the budget. Because uh, yeah. Natalie Portman at the time was a pretty big name yeah. coming off things like Star Wars, Black Swan, et cetera. I'll, I think Black Swan came the year after, but, but and she may have dropped out of this to do Black Swan. She may have. Uh, this film also, <laughs> I mentioned stars Eddie Renmaine. He had quite the couple years, because the year prior, he took home an Oscar for his work in The Theory of Everything Yep, as uh, Stephen Hawking. And for this film, he won the Golden Raspberry for the <laughs> worst supporting actor. <laughs> he was pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, the first time I watched this film, I saw Eddie Redmayne in this and saw his performance, and I... Couldn't help but think, I bet you the Academy is wondering if they can actually rescind that. <laughs> well, 
it starts begging the question, like, how does somebody get attached to this thing uh, with that level of caliber? Because you're kind of like, do you owe somebody some money or... I have to think there must have been some crossover with filming and releasing and maybe he even filmed this first before he did Theory of Everything. You never know. Yeah. Uh, and, I mean, he wasn't in the film a great deal. He may have spent, like, a week or two on this film. Yeah, his uh, his total presence in the film is is minor at best. He's definitely, because of his, uh, maybe his uh, star cash, na- you know, his name might have been uh, higher on some of the posters or something when it released after his theory of everything uh, Oscar win, but he is definitely not the star of this film. No, and, and it's not that they didn't get decent actors with good cred either, but this was just not good. <laughs> no, it it really wasn't. Well, you know, it's funny. I read that quote about Mila Kunis. Yeah. And I think it shows in her performance in the film. Yeah, it's kind of like her heart's not in it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of moments in this film where I feel like she's not trying at all. And, and, and given the mess that it is, and if they, if most of the cast went into this kind of knowing that this is just not good. Yeah. The, if their heart's not in it, if they're not putting the time in that, and, and it does, it has that feeling of a, a movie phoned in by most of its actors. Yeah. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. Cause, uh, Channing Tatum, who I, I don't know how he felt about this particular film, but clearly he was there to be shirtless. <laughs> And, and yeah. any dialogue that he was given was just hackney at best. And yeah, he just, I, I, he was sleepwalking through line delivery. Uh, there was no point where he looks like he's engaged while no. he, he's doing this. Honestly, I don't know. No, I don't know if any of them do. No, I, I really don't feel like anyone was really giving a hundred percent in this. And I want to say, like, oh, because, I mean, this fits into, well, it looked pretty. Um, and, and yes, there's lots of scenery and backdrop and special effects that are are amazing to look at. But I don't know. Th- this is just so weird, the way that it's kind of all glued together. That, and, and we end up just kind of repeating the same thing three different times because... Jupiter actually meeting her quote unquote family, um, each sibling slash whatever you want to call them as far as they're related to one another. Every time she meets them, she just goes through a, 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 a variation of what she just went through with the last one. Mm-hmm. It's not a good situation. They're there to basically take advantage of her. Some little bit of action sequence unfolds and then we move on and do the next one it is just a it is literally lather rinse repeat three times and then call it a day it's over yeah it it's almost like the wachowskis wrote um their own version of dune but in serial form yeah and what's interesting about this like I don't know if they were entirely on the wrong track. There is some interesting material here. But this two hour long, two hour and change um, movie was not the venue for this. Like, it, it's literally, it's too much to try to get in this short period of time and to then essentially just tell the same story three times in a row. Yeah. No, this is definitely a mini series or series mm-hmm. uh, fodder for sure. You you could do this in a big long form drama, uh, make it a you know a, a st- one of the streaming services and make it like the next big soap opera. No, because uh, one of the elements that I do want to give them full credit for is essentially the universe that they tried to lay out here, the notion that. Uh, and, and they beat it a little too much in when they were uh, when some of the characters were talking to Mila Kunis's character, 
the the notion that there there's way more to the universe than just what people of Earth think of, and, and you guys don't even rate because as we get through the movie, you're cattle. Um, mm-hmm. The entirety of the human population on Earth is just cattle for for their life their life extending process. So. That's why we're valuable, but that's also why we don't under we can't even possibly understand. So there's this whole history and mythology that that exists for this, and we don't really get it. So it's hard to get into it. Like they give you enough to just know that there is, but I mean we're not getting into it. Like right from the opening sequence when we're meeting with the three siblings that are going to be the thrust of the action that Jupiter will go through when they're talking to each other you're getting a sense of what they're talking about but I'm like lay that out for me I want to know more about this your version of the universe it actually sounded entertaining no it sounded really interesting and it sounded like something that you could bring in a lot of really great storytelling elements but not only is it only briefly kind of mentioned and is it briefly at any point part of the plot by the end of the movie it's completely forgotten Mm -hmm. jupiter you know is rescued she's now the queen or whatever yeah she owns the earth she just goes back to work as the cleaning woman and now her life is all fine and everything and i'm thinking there's still a universe of people out there calling and harvesting human beings on other worlds to prolong their lives. And we're just going to, we're just going to forget. We're, we're just going to drop that. Cause, Cause we saved earth. Yeah. Right. So that not my problem. Well, and, and, and they're <laughs> glossing over, uh, uh, cause I'm going back to what they were doing. They all own, significant portions of the known universe, not just a planet here, planet there. So Jupiter doesn't uh, just own Earth. She owns more than that. They didn't get into it. Right. But, I, I mean, as the reincarnated queen mother of this particular group, you have to figure, especially given that the they did make the point on the one planet, which was amusing. Again, we... we we had a very, uh, it had a very uh, Brazil kind of feel to it. Um, the planet uh, that was all the bureaucracy for mm-hmm. their given life. Um, but what we learn while we're going through all that, I mean, yeah, that she, she essentially probably owns the lion's share of the universe, right? But which is making the scene you're talking about that much more terrible that she is just excited. Okay, I own the earth. Now what? Uh, And like, Mm -hmm. no, 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 (laughs) no. You own a good hunk of the known universe and you want to go back to scrubbing toilets. Right. Yeah. Uh, Just real quick. You mentioned that it reminded you of... uh Terry Gilliam's Brazil yeah. and the bureaucracy and everything. Did you know that was uh, at one point Terry Gilliam as one of the uh, uh, guys behind the desk? Oh, really? He's the one that, he's the one that actually, the, the seal and signet minister who actually bestows Jupiter her title to Earth Yeah, is Terry Gilliam. Under a, a good deal of makeup, but that is him. I did not know that, and I didn't bother to look at the credits to find out. <laughs> like, yeah, and that, that scene was... Uh, purposely designed to resemble his brazil uh, okay we'll see there I, I i i'm insightful without even knowing <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> yeah i remember um talking to you i don't remember who was on or off mic but i thought this was based on a young adult novel yeah it kind of has that feel it very much has that feel. I understand where I got it, where I get that impression from. Uh, but no, this apparently was an, an original creation by the Wachowskis. Uh, and it's just, I don't know, Wachowskis, I, boy, they are hit or miss, aren't they? They, they, 
And, and they give us the Matrix. Here's the thing, though. There's probably more miss than hit. <laughs> yeah, I'm really starting to feel that way. Do, are they really kind of like they gave us one really great film that like changed cinema forever? Mm-hmm. And then what have they given us? What have you done for us lately? <laughs> I mean, I, earlier in the year, we did Speed Racer. Right. Um, and, Which and we enjoyed. We, we enjoyed, but it's not a good film. It, 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 it's eye candy. It, 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 it's pornography for the eyeball. It, yes. I mean, it's just meant to d- dazzle and delight, but... Uh, not a lot of substance. Uh, there's potential, but not met. Um, and that's what Jupiter Ascending kind of is. And actually, it's kind of funny until I read the same stuff about the Wachowskis um, doing this as original material. Mm-hmm. It really c- was kind of reminiscent to me. Like, what if you took Star Wars and gave it a real Twilight vibe to it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just even the um oh the idea that even the character is like oh I'm I'm human and you know I'm spliced with like a can like with a wolf or a canine and I'm like yeah this is this is YA stuff. I mean this isn't good. Yeah, <laughs> it's and, bad ideas. Well, and that was problematic too cuz every time they introduced a new element something we wouldn't be familiar with from this world they just went into crazy exposition. I, I mean, that's half of what uh, Channing Tatum's job was, was just to explain what it is that you just saw. Mm-hmm. I'm like, great. You're good. Good boy. <laughs> yeah. 10, 20 years ago, I can see where I'd eat a lot of the stuff that they'd come up in this universe up. I mean, the idea of, I, you've got the uh, the one race of, beings that look like dragons yeah uh you know the 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 whole idea that uh uh, they were looking for you know the human race started in some other planet and some other side of the galaxy and they were looking for places to the planets to seed Mm -hmm. and they found earth and so they had to kill off all the the dinosaurs first and I'm eating this stuff up that would be yeah no that's amazing And, and, and actually again missed Missed opportunity needs to be a larger format than this. Um, when they introduced the reptilians with the wings, yeah, I'm like going, was that the potential of a Saurian race of dinosaurs if they had got given been given the chance to finish evolving? I mean, well, they at one point they they give some hint to to an idea that they are responsible for a lot of our mythology. Yeah. Uh, Jupiter asks um, Kalik, "Are you guys some sort of vampire race?" And and Kalik just sort of chuckles it off, you know, laughs it off, and says, "We are responsible for a lot of those myths." I'm thinking, "You're responsible for vampires and werewolves, and you're responsible for dragons, and it's just, it, it, could we talk about that maybe a little bit?" <laughs> kind of. Um... And I'm going to go in a little different direction, but off the same kind of note. Okay, so they introduce that stuff, and you want more. Um, we get introduced at the beginning uh, to Jupiter's story uh, of her her mother and father meeting, and her being born, and him being all into astronomy. He's got this telescope, and none of that has anything to do with who she is. No. Because she's just to... a reincarnation uh, based off the seeding of Earth. It just happened. So, right. but they built up. Literally, we spent the first like fifteen minutes of the movie on, on this particular topic, and it went nowhere and did nothing. Yeah, it tried to establish her as someone that feeling like she doesn't belong anywhere, right? Because she was born during the crossing from Europe. So she was, as she put it, she was born without a country. I'm like, well, you were on the ship, whatever ship that, the nationality or whatever, of the ship what, whatever nationality that ship uh, was was licensed to was. That's who you are. But yeah. anyway, forgetting that, they wanted to make her seem like she she never belo- she didn't feel like she belonged anywhere, et cetera, et cetera. 
so why does she return to all that? You finally find your place. You could be the queen of this universe and, 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 and make changes and do good in the universe. No, I'm just going to go back to, as you put it, I'm going to go back to scrubbing toilets while the rest of the universe eats itself. Well, and we were highly hyper-focused toward the end on her family because the the one Balaam, um, he, he kidnaps her her family as a way to leverage her giving up her inheritance. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the end of all this, she saved her family. She is wealthier beyond any sense that we have of wealth. So therefore you figure she could turn that somehow tangible actually on earth in some fashion. And she carries on with her family scrubbing toilets and letting them all live in the same room and all this stuff. I'm like, you can elevate your own family status. You just saved their lives. Now you can make their lives so much better. And you could sneak in a way to do it. You're not gonna. <laughs> no. And she starts out, you know, oh, I hate my life. Yep. She's miserable at her job. She hates doing what she's doing. But now that she knows she's the owner of Earth... Suddenly, it's all puppies and rainbows, and she loves her job and loves her family. Like, this plays the wrong way around. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get this motivation. No, like, and... She see, finally found her place, but her place is apparently right where she always was. It's family that's the most important, Tom. Is that the lesson we're supposed to be getting here? Not entirely sure that there was a lesson <laughs> This lesson in not how and how not to make a movie. Um, it it kind of is that because, uh, uh, yeah, we we can pick on all of these elements. Um, I, I just had one that flew out of my head. Uh, it just yeah. the the notion uh, the family is supposed to factor in, but there is no family. Oh, here the point that I was uh, trying to latch on to. So she's the reincarnation of their mother. And apparently the, the utterance at early on about how um, she hates her life. Mm -hmm. That gets used against her as supposedly that's what her mo that's what the mother said at some yes. point is that she hates her life and supposedly that's what she said as she's dying or something uh, related Being to murdered by Balaam. Yeah. So we we get him involved but like None of that hit, hits home because they're they're completely detached from one another because they keep introducing mentioning the, this mysterious um, mother to which she is. But we didn't even get any of that in like a flashback or anything that would have at least cemented why that matters. Mm -hmm. Like there again, there was some opportunity there and they. And Mila Kunis could have done the mother role. She's supposed to be identical to her. So they could have had her in some fashion actually giving us some background. And we chose not to do that. Yeah, and even what background we did get about her mother from the, the one brother. I, uh, I've i already forgot his name. Uh, uh, Ty, uh, the one brother, Titus. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he tells her the story of how she was... Um, regretting you know this this that they've been using human beings as cattle to make this fluid that extends their life and she was regretting it and she wanted to change their ways but we i i don't know if that was actually true or if that was just titus weaving a story to manipulate jupiter to get you know what he wanted out of her yeah, and that was the thing. With e each one of the siblings, you got a variation on that. So we don't actually know. And that's what's frustrating. We're s there's supposed to be a lot of history here, but we don't actually know any of it. And you're getting it from three liars. Mm -hmm. It feels l unsatisfying. Yeah. Like, like, uh, like there's a... It's almost like an inside joke. There, someone somewhere knows what all is happening and what they're talking about, but they haven't bothered to let us in on it. Right. 
Yeah, it, I, I mentioned it before. I, I think this was the Wachowskis trying to create a universe as as involved and, and detailed as Herbert's Dune. Sure. And they tried to tell it in under two hours. Yeah. And if you're going to try to tell that kind of story, I mean, I think you need those four hours. Not that I really want to see this movie for four hours, but you, you, you just you can't do it. No. No, I, I, I mean, we've been touching on that from the start of the conversation. It, it's too big. You are mm-hmm. trying to... And we have John Carter on the way still this year, and it it's going to be the same scenario. The, uh, watching this has a John Carter feel about it, too. It, it's There's an awful lot there. It's not that necessarily all of it's... That the base material is bad. It's just... It's too much to consume in a short period of time that you can't do it justice. And then when you, in this case, in the case of Jupiter Ascending, you've you've got a cast that clearly isn't that into it. No. And I don't know if it's actor or... No, I'll put this solely on the Wachowskis as directors. Mm -hmm. The performance of someone like Eddie Redmayne and his ridiculous decision or their decision to have him do the, the whispery voice thing. Yeah. Which would occasionally break into outright scream for no apparent reason. Um, that's, it was just bad. Uh, the first time I watched this film ages ago, uh, I think the, the uh, transfers are a little better, but I remember the first time I tried to watch this movie, I couldn't understand a word the man was saying. It is one of those. It was one of those DVDs where all the dialogue was really quiet, and then it would, the explosion would knock things off shelves. Yeah. Uh, so I think that the uh, the the Blu-ray or DVD transfers have improved since then, <laughs> and they've uh, evened that out a little bit because I had a much easier time with them this time. But it was still just. Why is he doing? Why are you letting him do that? Why did you tell him to do that? Whatever the case is, why is he doing that? Yeah, and that would have to be all. Um, since since this is their story, their direction, I can't see him proposing that. I mean, the actor would have nothing to feed off of. Mm-hmm. So, no, I, it, yeah, I don't get the uh, creative choice on that particular decision. No, I, no, not not at all. And then for two directors that then can't get more, um, can't get more of a performance out of their actors, is it's just a, sh- you know, maybe you should have handed it to somebody else. You wanted to write the story, fine. Maybe you had a, sh- you should have had someone else try to direct this thing, because I think you could have come up with a pretty cool action film. Oh yeah. Um. Other than the fact that, you know, I think this came out in the height of everything's got to be 3D. Yeah. And this film, I think, shows it. It And I think I'd probably, probably get sick watching this in 3D. Some of the action scenes are almost chaos. You can't really figure out what the hell is happening. There are moments when Kane is trying to escape from... Um, the, the the keepers or whatever they were called. Yeah, they're so- and there's ships flying and there's things exploding and I'm going, I don't know who's who. Is is he shooting him? Is he being shot out? I I have no freaking clue. Yeah, no, because yeah, once he gets into the same model ship, yeah, it, mm-hmm. it gets super confusing, especially since they chose to do the ships in um I don't know. It's a trend that comes and goes, but the the complete uh, that I, and unfortunately, Star Trek Discovery <laughs> included it. It's the disjointed the ship. The the right. the parts don't necessarily connect. Yeah, they're all connected through gravity or some force of some kind. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 which starts becoming and feeling more magic than science. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, no, I'm not not saying somebody didn't read something somewhere that suggests that this is a possibility, but putting it on the screen, it looks weird, and it makes it it does it makes it hard to track what the hell's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of the action scenes are just a little bit too 
well, frankly, too much action. <laughs> well, it, it, the thing I was focused on heavily, because, I mean, since it, it's going to be all CGI when they're inside a ship, and on a number of those ships, um, it's almost like the, the thing got built around them, uh, particularly when we're going into the more climactic scene at the toward the end and uh they're climbing into the ship and it's forming kind of this weird angel like uh formation around them Mm -hmm. but but given the amount of stuff coming at them the fact that they're just stand there the behavior that the actors are doing on on screen is to just stare straight ahead and punch their arms very quickly in one direction, and you're just to assume that lines up with whatever activity is actually happening outside the ship, which is just utter chaos. Yeah. You're like, I don't know what I'm watching, and I don't care. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that that falls what I was saying too. Yeah, there's scenes where uh, Kane is in the cockpit, and he's got just got his arms out, and it's got the glowy rings around his hands. So he's at at some controls, and he's he's making motions, but it's all enclosed in the cockpit. So you don't see anything outside the ship at that moment. Yeah. And then you see a couple ships and things happening, but it's like, is he doing that? It, which one is he doing that to? It, it, it looks, it's a, it's a cheap, it reminds me of some of like the really bad, like seventies, uh, cheap sci-fi where you got the people just kind of sitting and rocking in something that is definitely not a spaceship. <laughs> And then there's like stock footage of spaceships. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, the, it has a lot of that feel. And a, a, actually, I kind of find it funny. As advanced as the civilization is supposed to be, that uh, everything still boils down to a dogfight. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it just occurred to me. It it feels like you're watching like the 1970s Battlestar Galactica. Uh huh. Oh yeah. Where the oh, guys yeah. are just sitting in the cockpit set, and you don't see anything else, and then suddenly that same footage is over you. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, this was no. A, a lot of these sequences weren't uh, only. I felt more grounded in a Battlestar Galactica fight sequence than I did in these. It, it's too surreal. It's too complicated. There is no threat sense. At least in the Battlestar Galactic, they would occasionally tilt the camera so you get the impression that they banked their vipers. (laughs) And this, literally, Kane is just in the same position the whole time, just moving and ah! Yeah, he's just doing that constant punching thing at the screen. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I believe you're doing something. (laughs) Sure. But yeah, no, I, that's what I'm getting at. The action sequences, I don't feel invested. I, I You can't make out what's really happening. I mean, you can, but I mean, it, it's just, it's too much uh, and you don't have a real sense of perspective. And then the thing that made me mad more than anything since we're on their action sequences is they destroy Chicago. Mm-hmm. And they just simply suggest oh, the Keepers will make that go away. And they use this as some sort of weird, um, this weird little aside to how alien abduction stories get made. We get a men in black moment where they can, we're going to mind wipe everyone, but the ones that we miss, no one will believe them. Right. And like, oh, Christ. (laughs) Yeah. And then the shitty the city is really uh, it's just repairing itself in the background. There's no consequence to the thing that just happened. And like at that stage, again, why would they care? Earth is cattle, um, right? Yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good point. Why do they care whether anyone sees any of this going on, or you know what they think or what they say about any of it? What what threat could it possibly be to them? Because, and in this particular case, because they have mentioned it outright that Earth is at the verge of the calling uh, sequence. I mean, that's why they're all wanting the planet right now is we're achieving our max population before the world can't sustain us anymore. They mention it specifically in the movie that that's the stage in which you will be harvested 
So why do they care what the mental state of any of the population is at that point? Anyways, right. they're coming to collect. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it, that's the kind of stuff. Uh, you had an interesting idea, but you didn't even play within your own rules. Yeah, I, I think that's their... That's the Matrix sneaking back in. Sure. You know, their their Matrix idea mm -hmm. sneaking back into their work. I, I, I get that, but you you went you wrote a different story. Go a different right. way. <laughs> well, I did throw this out to social media that we'd be watching it. Did not get much in the way of responses on this one. I think we only got one comment over on Facebook. Uh, Kevin Brewer says that he thinks it's a vastly underrated and it deserves more love. Says I can't remember what it was released with, but that's why it bombed. I think Gods of Egypt was out too, if I'm not mistaken. So no, I don't know what came out the same year as this, or the same, you know, at the same time as this film. It, it could have been a factor, uh, obviously, but uh, perhaps. But yeah, I, 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 I think it's getting as much love as it actually deserves. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. I was really hoping to maybe. Uh, get a little bit more out of this this viewing yeah and yeah it, it, it is just a um again it's it's a universe that'd be worth exploring yeah and not only does do we not get enough of it in this film we don't even get like an attempt <laughs> no and, and, and that's the loss in this yeah so what about the critics what did the professionals have to say about this at the time oh that was the the sum total of our <laughs> our response is great um yeah sorry yeah that was it well uh, the critics aren't agreeing with our friend there uh chicago sun times rich roper the excerpt doesn't get more plain than this there's no defending jupiter ascending there's no explaining jupiter ascending there is no way jupiter ascending isn't making an appearance on my list of the worst films of 2015 <laughs> so, so obviously a lot of love there yeah oh i i should mention that while eddie redmayne you know he won the golden raspberry yeah. for the worst supporting actor this film was non nominated for i think every category <laughs> in the golden raspberries well, so why wouldn't it have been yes then we go over to usa today uh claudia pugue Pig, I don't know how to pronounce. P-U-I-G. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I tried. Claudia, give me a call. We'll talk about how to pronounce your name. Um, Jupiter Ascending is a sharp descent for everyone involved. I think they're trying to play on the ascending versus uh, ascending, thing. descending, yes. Mm -hmm. The sci-fi film's reported $175 million budget must have gone largely into loopy production design, wild costumes, outlandish hairstyles, and colorful makeup. It certainly didn't go into developing a coherent script or coaching believable performances. The story is laughably inane and uninvolving. The brains behind the Matrix movies, Lana and Andy Wachowski... What? Wachowski, mm -hmm. are responsible for this ambitious misfire. A ridiculous intergalactic action adventure, Jupiter even draws a risible, and I, I guess that's how you say that word, uh, portrayal from an Oscar-nominated actor. So, <laughs> risible, R-I-S-I-B-L-E, risible. Uh, risible, risible. I didn't bother to look it up beforehand. Everybody, go visit a dictionary. I don't know what she means. <laughs> and then, Read the next one! <laughs> Good job. You can get a Razzie yourself. Um, <laughs> and now we have uh, from RogerEbert.com, Matt Zoller Zeist. Um, he says... Uh, Jupiter Ascending is an example of a particularly depressing sort of bad blockbuster, one made by artists that you might not know were artists unless you'd seen their other films. It's not so bad it's good, which would at least promise a certain lunk-headed 
obsessiveness. Nor is it an aim for the moon and land among the stars bad, or any other subcategory of bad that one could make a critical case for. It's blandly, often listlessly bad, check the blockbuster boxes bad, just out of film school and shopping a tentpole screenplay bad. That's the last thing I would have expected from the directors of Speed Racer, a film whose neon and steel and peyote aesthetic went beyond incoherence and attained psychedelic poetry. And Cloud Atlas, a fable about reincarnation, the indestructibility of true love, and the brotherhood of man that wanted to be a modern intolerance and got startling close at times. Lots and lots and lots of wordy to say, it's not a good movie. Yeah. And, you know, this was the film. They just came off Cloud Atlas. I think a lot of Cloud Atlas bled into this one. The whole I, the reincarnation, the idea of, you know, uh, genetics relooping and, and all that. Yeah. Yeah, I... I I have a feeling the Wachowskis really have a hard time disassociating themselves from one project to another. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One would oh, thank God they haven't gotten a hold of like a known property. Lauren only knows where that would go. Oh yeah, no kidding. The Wachowskis present Star Wars Ten. Oh yeah. God, <laughs> I gotta go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no that that. If I were to go on to any of the other critics, those were the ones from the main things that I could find. But, but I mean, yeah, critically, this was not a well-loved film. Yep, understood. Yeah, it's just, it's disappointing. I, you know, what's really a shame is when something like this that has such a rich backdrop mm-hmm. that isn't explored, and it does so poorly at the box office, it means you're never going to be able to explore that. No, exactly. No, 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 Amazon, Netflix, you know, none of the streaming services are ever going to go. You know what we could do? You know, a, a mini series. Let's do a series based on X property. They're not going to do that for a movie that did this poorly. No, the, but here's the thought, and it's not the first time that something like that, they're not going to do it off of this property at this time Mm. but if you put another 20 years between (laughs) us and a a decade isn't enough (laughs) no and i'm kind of not kidding uh you need this to completely drop out of any sense of um conversation someone could revisit this and go much like we're describing go it's a garbage film, but there's some really neat ideas in there. And then they could do a total retelling and make the masterpiece of a lifetime. So you're saying by us talking about it on this show, we are stopping somebody from doing just that because we're keeping it in the uh, people's mindset. It, it, it is my fear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, we have such uh, a reach in, into the universe that uh, that they're going to have to be on one of these other planets. <laughs> Warner Brothers was definitely listening and then thought they were, they were just on the cusp and then they tuned us in and went, oof, let's, let's wait a little while. <laughs> Sorry, folks. The Netflix team, were, 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 they were on it. They were on it. <laughs> well, and what about bees? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was a bit of a stretch talking about how they're genetically, <laughs> somehow bees are genetically uh, made to recognize royalty or something. Yeah, it was uh, uh, the reason I picked on that in the last moment is in either one of these, uh, in the longer form of one of these uh, reviews, or it was a different one that I just didn't include. Someone couldn't understand how um, Sean held a straight face while delivering that particular line. <laughs> yeah. That that was a bit of a uh that was a stretch. So explain wasps then. <laughs> <laughs> 
they're just hateful little creatures. That's all. Yes, that's yes. the only way what? to explain wasps. But yeah. Yes. But yeah, no, there was no point in any of this where it wasn't a little bit ridiculous all the time, even when it was trying to be cool. No, no, it, it, it again, the Wachowskis went for some sort of visual, even if it made no sense whatsoever. Yeah. What happened to Sean Bean's daughter or whatever she was? She goes off to town to get food. They're attacked. They leave the planet. <laughs> That that'll Does get... she just come home and find a decimated house and go? Hmm, oh well, that that'll come up in the new Tubi series when it uh, <laughs> comes out. When when in twenty years when Tubi overtakes uh, Netflix, um, yes. and, and they're the reigning powerhouse of the streaming world, they'll create uh, Jupiter Ascending the series, and, and we'll fit we'll get the answer to it then. Good. All right. Good. At least I have that to look for. So, folks, to. in a future episode, when we are reviewing the new series in twenty years from now, <laughs> we'll be sure to cover this. Yeah, absolutely. We'll go. We'll we'll go back and re-listen to this and uh, remind ourselves of all the wonderful, insightful things we said. Absolutely. Well, until then, we got to look forward to our next episode. We are going to step back to twenty eleven and look at Zack Snyder's Sucker Punch. I'm actually kind of looking forward to this. As am I. I like Sunker Punch. I am one of the few that will go to some amount of defense to this film. There's a good chance we're not going to be lambasting uh, that one like we have uh, a a number of the ones in this particular series. (laughs) We've had a bad run here in the last uh, few episodes. It's been a little decrepit, so it might not be everybody's favorite, but at least we get a bit of a palate cleanser. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) We shall see. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, well, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please uh, follow the link in the show notes to find all our social media sites and our email address, which is timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. Please drop us any uh, emails, uh, comments, suggestions. Uh, Please send those our way. Thanks for uh, listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time. See ya. I didn't say bye again, did I? Say bye. (laughs) Bye. See ya.